Welcome to the Hermit's Land Podcast. I'm going to get to the podcast in a minute, but before I do, I want to tell you about this thing that I've been working on for about five years now. Just after my godmother died from cancer, I realized that if we wanted to overcome all the crap that goes on in this world, we really needed to maybe find a way to work to help life fight against um all the problems that we face, sickness, death, loss, hate, all of it. So I started this process of making a tarot deck with a whole bunch of other artists to raise money for cancer research. And I called it the Triumph of Life deck. Each artist made a card that pointed to the hope and the possibilities that could be found in that card to help people move forward from times of difficulty. So here we are, and now it's done. And all of the money from creating this deck is going to go towards cancer research. So jump over to thehermitslamp.com slash T-O-L for Triumph of Life and get yourself one. Welcome to another episode of the Hermit's Lamp podcast. I am here today with Cyrus Marcus Ware, who is a fantastic artist, a, an activist, and uh and a very spiritual human being also and you know i i wanted to talk with cyrus about a variety of things but it's definitely started out of uh, me looking for somebody that i could talk about uh identity and uh portraiture and representation and self-exploration through those kinds of ideas as well as uh you know a whole bunch of other stuff that we're going to get to but for anybody who doesn't know who you are, Cyrus, who are you? Um, yeah, I'm a visual artist. I'm an activist. Uh, I am a parent of a six-year-old. I'm an identical twin. Um, and I use portraiture a lot in my artistic practice. I've been doing um, portraiture probably for the last maybe five or six years, very large scale, 12 feet by six feet, um, or 12 feet by five feet. And uh, I have been sort of trying to figure out, but before that I was working on self-portraiture. So I've been working in portraiture for at least a decade and trying to figure out how to spend my days staring lovingly into the eyes of other people, which is what I get to do when I draw people. That sounds pretty awesome. How how do people feel about that? How How is that experience? What do you hear from the other side of that? Well, I think a lot of times people are really nervous about coming to get their portrait done because there's all these preconceptions that all has a lot to do with class and has a lot to do with um, sort of your positionality in the world that, you know, getting, sitting to have your portrait done is this big deal and you have to hold really still and you, you kind of become less and less yourself by the time the photo is taken, right? Um, as you get more and more worked up into your anxieties. And so what I do is very different than that. I invite people to come and we, if we can, we usually eat something, but sometimes that's not possible with people's timing. And we um, have a conversation that I tell them I'm gonna record in advance. And I record a conversation where I ask these questions that are very random, seemingly random, but that are questions that provoke different facial reactions, very distinctly different facial reactions. And so I ask them these questions one at a time. And then they kind of, one of the questions is about their activism, which maybe, you know, seems like an expected question, but then I ask them about time travel. I ask them about um, their feeling, what it feels like when they feel like they're first falling in love. And I ask them questions that I guess they don't always get asked. So they're usually sort of surprised and then they kind of get into answering them and by that point the ice is broken a little bit and then you get to I take photos during the entire time and you get to really see them 
you know, in, in the way that they're answering or thinking or moving their hands or looking up to the left or just really trying to imagine a future self. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Yeah. I think that, um, being, being the center of attention isn't something that gets to happen a lot. And especially in a really, um, caring and focused way, right? Which it sounds like this conversation is. And the majority of people who who do get to be the center of attention on a, on a regular, um, people who are used to having their portraits painted, like the Pope or, or kings or university presidents or hospital presidents and administrators, like they, there's just, a, I think, an entitlement. But of course, of course you're going to draw a portrait of me. And I think that for the people I draw portraits of, they're unlikely. They're people who wouldn't normally be recorded for all of history. So there is a, res- a reticence, for sure, um, to to start it. But then hopefully we get there by the end. Mm-hmm. I always know that whenever someone gets a camera out and I'm aware that they're pointing it at me, all of a sudden I get like the dorkiest, most like unlike me smile totally. and uptightness happening, right? I have to say, like, I draw people all day, um, most of my days when I'm at home, and I am totally uncomfortable in front of the camera. Like, the second someone takes the camera, especially if it's video, I'm super, super, super uncomfortable. Like, all, all of the things that I would tell someone else to get them comfortable, I seem unable to tell myself, and so I'm just super dorky. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, when people are seeing these, do they... Do they see themselves in it? Do they do they see something that they didn't recognize before? Like, what's their relationship to this? The most because this portrait series has been of activists, and so the most common reaction that I get is people it makes, it makes people sort of think about their own activism and about what they're involved in and what they are engaged with, what they're passionate about, and what they want to change. That's the most common reaction, and then the second most common reaction I get. Um, is that people say that they feel like they know the person in the drawing, even though they don't, just because there's a sense of familiarity and a, and a relationship that is built through the way that it's drawn that either makes you feel like you know the person or make you feel like you want to know the person, which is like a secondary goal of the project, really, because we are all very disconnected and isolated, in particular within activist communities. And so trying to find ways to to build bridges and to start relationships has been really interesting to me. So this, um, this act of, of drawing people in such a way that is an opening or an offering for other people to be like, Oh my gosh, I want to know this person. How do I, how do I find out more about them? How do I, you know, this, this has been about resiliency and about supporting each other and making sure that we all survive and that we all can thrive in our lives. And so that action and that activity of feeling compelled to get to know someone um and to relate across difference like audrey lord says is a big part of why i do what i do it's amazing yeah i think that you know we're it's really easy to to be separate or to be separated you know and especially in in sort of the world these days right like it seems to me that uh a lot of the people who are coming to see me for readings are looking to figure out how to connect you know, and, and some of that is certainly they're looking to connect romantically, but a lot of people are just trying to figure out how to connect and where they're connecting in the world, right? Yeah, totally. Because we are, I mean, we have a way, particularly within North American society, and if you're in sort of that like Protestant work ethic, work, you know, for all of the ways that we get kind of, I guess, suckered into giving our life blood in exchange for money or resources. <laughs> if we all, you know, are kind of in these, in the situation because of capitalism, you really may be in a situation where the only people that you interact with are your family unit and then the people that you meet at the office. And that's not really a lot of people. And that's not necessarily the kinds of deep connections. Like the exchange that you have with the photocopier is not necessarily the one that's going to profoundly move your soul, but maybe, maybe it will. Um, mm-hmm. So just figuring out um, ways for people to reach and meet each other across distance has been really interesting to me. So when I started doing these portraits, it actually grew out of this other project 
that was called Activist Love Letters, where I got people to write letters to strangers um, across vast distances um, about uh, their activism. So I had bios and write-ups about different activists, and I would get people to pick someone to write to. Uh, I would read letters that, that sort of more famous activists had written to each other, and I would get people to write letters um, to each other, and then I would mail them. And um, that was like the most extreme kind of version where someone here is writing to someone in the Philippines who they've never met. Um, you know, someone here is writing to someone in Japan and just being like, oh, by the way, here, thanks for this thing that you do that you might not even realize is making these ripples, but it is. And mm-hmm. so that um, way of trying to get people to relate across difference and distance uh, inspired me to want to go further with it. And so part of this act of reverence, this act of drawing people larger than life is a way of getting people to want to make that connection. Because I think hun- humans fundamentally are group animals. Like we enjoy being around each other, um, even those of us who struggle with social anxiety and, and awkwardness and stuff like that. There is something about being connected to other people that we, we seem to thrive, right? Mm-hmm. we seem to thrive from so and how do the how do the people who uh well receive these love letters or the people who are having their portraits done how do they react to this because i know like sometimes people come up to me and you know every so often somebody comes up and they're like oh thanks for everything you do in the tarot community or other things and i'm always like what what you, I, what I, sorry huh are you talking to me like there's always yeah. this very like you know, I, it's it's welcome, but it's so it's such a, a sort of sometimes jarring uh, yeah. experience because we're not conditioned and we don't experience it very much, right? Like we're and to see to have yourself reflected back by another person is not something that we do that often. And so, like I would say that every single person that I have ever interviewed, because I interview every single person before I draw them. Um, every single person that I've ever interviewed has said, okay, but it's okay that you're doing me, right? Because I'm not really an activist. Oh. I'm just da, 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 da. Or I just do da, 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 da. But then as if there's this fictitious <laughs> activist out there who's doing all of the things that we're not. Um, you know what I mean? So mm-hmm. so I think there is a way of, that it does affect people. I drew someone recently and she was saying how it had made even just the act of being drawn made her feel more empowered to be an activist and to sort of take up that as an identity in a way that she hadn't before, despite the fact that she had been doing a lot of, you know, sort of challenging white supremacy work within her community. So I think um, the act of doing it or receiving a letter or whatever does kind of make you think about your place in the life. I, with the letters, I always include a little blurb about the project and people do write me back. And one of the first letters I ever wrote was to somebody who was heading up a large arts administ- or, uh, artist-run center in Toronto. And he received this, this letter at this moment where he was wondering if he was an actress. He was wondering what his next step in life was going to be. He was wondering what his purpose was. And then he received this letter from a stranger just saying, oh my God, I just want you to know you're everything. Like you're enough. Like everything that you have been doing has impacted my life in this way. And I just want to thank you. And he wrote me back this profound letter just about how he had been wondering if it was time to make a change and the letter confirmed it for him. And he ended up moving out of the city and moved to the country and has this beautiful life, you know? And he felt inspired to trust in himself in a different way because of this communication that he got from a stranger through the void, right? You know, Mm -hmm. um, unexpected and then arrived on the exact right day. I'm really bad at mailing letters. So doing this mailing project was also a challenge for me. I don't always mail letters right away. So the letters do seem to come right when they're supposed to come. You know, they don't come within two to three days after the workshop, like they come when they're supposed to come. So, um, yeah, I really enjoyed hearing back from people about the impact. But I would say that in general, most people are very self-deprecating about how much they do or what they do. Um, That has been like universal. I was interviewing someone who she uh, had, um, was born with a disability. Her son was an amputee. They wanted to recycle and reuse their prosthetics because they uh, had been traveling back home 
on the continent and met somebody who didn't have access to prosthetics and they were like, well, we have prosthetics. You can't reuse prosthetics in Canada. You can't donate them. You can't share them. It's just part of the, the law. So she was like, well, hold on. But all of these prosthetics then that are going to the landfill could be gone, could be sent around the world. And so she's collected 60,000 prosthetics. It's called prosthetics for foreign donation and shipped them out all over the world. And she has a warehouse in Winnipeg filled with these prosthetics and she was like oh but I don't really do that much Mm -hmm. you know (laughs) like there's like even when there's so much demonstrable um evidence that we are living in this world and trying to make it the world that we want to live in trying to make the world a beautiful place we have a lot of self-doubt I think about what we're actually doing and what we're capable of doing so how do you how do you personally challenge that for yourself assuming you're one of these humans with it yeah, I think uh, it's, hmm, how do I, ch- I mean, I'm involved in a lot of different things and I do feel like very, like I've received activist love letters. Sometimes people will send them to me or they'll write them to me in the workshop and I'm always like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like mm-hmm. it's hard to take it in sometimes really, um, even though I get so much joy from sharing it out to other people. I think, um, you know, being able to sit with yourself is, is can be helped by having someone else's reflections reflected back to you. Um, so I try to sit with the letters and I try to really absorb them. Um, and that's been helpful. Do you think that this is a, a human being problem? Do you think this is a, a cultural thing? Is this a, you know, is this a byproduct of capitalism or colonialism or one of these other kind of things? Like, why, why do you think we all struggle? Because it seems like many people, most people I know, struggle with this kind of stuff. Yeah, I think um, it absolutely is a byproduct of working within a capitalist system where you're valued by how much you can produce. So the minute that anything affects your level of production, your perceived value goes down. And I think that we have um, different kinds of levels of production, how we are in a relationship, how we are in a friendship, how we are in our jobs, you know, all of these different things that we're measuring ourselves against. Mm-hmm. And um, there is a way that we, we kind of um, decrease our value when we can't compete with what is an unrealistic expectation, which is capitalist, con- you know, continued um, production at at infinitum which is impossible for anybody so um yeah i think that we are definitely a part of that and then certainly being within a north american context which is where i live on turtle island where you know there's there's dramatic dramatic upswings of activism that are very high profile um, that of course are made up of minutia, like mi- tiny decisions all throughout led to the kinds of activism we saw at Standing Rock or the kinds of activism that we saw at Tent City. There are a million tiny decisions made by individuals, which is what we're doing, right? We're making millions of tiny decisions, mm-hmm. but we see the big, giant, massive, um, if, you know, the sort of culmination of the, of the, the massive activism as if it just happened from the sky and we think, well, I couldn't have done that, you know, and so we put ourselves down when in fact mm. we actually are them. We are the person who made the photocopies or the person who made the banner, you know, all the little pieces yeah. that come together to make the whole. So part of that, I think is just this North American way of, um, of you know, the, pres- the pr- presumption of productivity. Mm-hmm. And there's such an emphasis on, being productive too, right? In one way or another, that's just fatiguing, you know? Fatiguing and it doesn't work for people with disabilities and it doesn't work for people who have kids and it doesn't work for people who, you know, who just think and their brains and emotions work in different ways. So Mm. it's just, we have these expectations that don't really work for the majority and yet we keep them up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and that's one of the things that I wanted to chat with you about, right? You know? Um, I'm curious to talk about, um, you know, what I've seen you describe as being mad, right? Yeah. Like, you know, I, I, I don't know, I don't know, I don't quite know where to start with this, but like, you know, 
what what does it mean to identify as somebody who's mad? Let's start with that question. Yeah, I mean, I think being like over the years, over the last twenty years, you know, it's just been something that has shifted and changed for me. When I first came out, um, I, I would identify probably as a psychiatric survivor because I had been in the psychiatric industry and I had been institutionalized and I felt very, um, very much like a product of an industry, you know, and I think that coming into a mad pride really just in the last couple of years, you know, where it's sort of focused on mad people describing for themselves and reclaiming this word as a sense of pride, you know, Mm -hmm. um, and being able to sort of celebrate the ways that our brains and, and minds work. I was in, um, Ottawa in June and I was really having a hard I mean this year was very difficult for me it was you know the return of some of the more unfortunate parts of my mental illness and it was really challenging it was a really challenging part so I was talking to a friend who also experiences psychosis and I said you know I mentioned what had been going on and she said oh my gosh did you at least get to have fun was there any parts of it that was fun? Which is something that only somebody else who has experienced it would say to you. Because if mm-hmm. you weren't mad, you'd be like, oh gosh, that's terrible. And you just leave it in the realm of the terrible. But what she was doing was she was offering a possibility for the celebration of the ways that our minds work. Because some, I mean, my experience with psychosis wasn't fun, but sometimes it can be fun to be like, whoa, it's like a free and legal high. Well, folks, Sometimes the internets don't help at all. Uh, our call just dropped, and uh, instead of trying to pretend and recreate where we were, we're just going to continue ahead. So uh, I'm going to I'm going to start by asking you the question. So uh, when when you're because we were kind of talking about sort of uh, celebrating possibilities of of different mental health states or mental uh, mindsets and those kinds of things, and I'm curious, one of the things that I'm very curious about that is because the idea of being mad is kind of a dangerous idea, or like, so it seems, right? Mm -hmm. People often use it in a kind of uh, a way that marks people as being dangerous in some way. And so I'm really curious how other people have related to you sort of bringing that out as something that you're, you're being more open and more direct about. Yeah, I mean, definitely it's the kind of thing that you have to feel safe enough to sort of talk about because we have a phenomenon where we, particularly in, within North America, but I think more generally, humans fear madness because it's like the trope in every TV show, every movie, you're just suddenly going to go mad and, and that it looks the same way for every person and that you end up, I don't know, um, completely disconnected from reality and, and never again able to be in charge of your life that's the image that we're given about madness and uh-huh. it's it's in, in wildly incorrect um <laughs> but i think that because of that people are very afraid of madness and so it's very common for example for um uh people to see uh you know strangers on the street who are behaving in ways that are deemed to be unexpectable unexpected sorry or unacceptable in public space because we have a modicum of uh, sort of how to behave in public space that's rooted in a sanest idea like there's certain ways that we can be like we don't talk to strangers we don't talk to buildings we don't talk to for example um and then you have the reality of like people who behave in ways that are unexpected in public space and that that's usually where the intervention happens so in order to help often the public will call the police um, to bring them to sort of fix the situation, which usually isn't so much about helping the person who's experiencing psychosis or whatever, but more about removing something unexpected from the park or from the public space so that we can get on with our day of just enjoying a regular day. Um, So removing and and obscuring um, madness out of our reality, out of our view frame. Um, and for black people, that's been particularly dangerous because when the police come and there's an interaction that is centered around madness, often there's a fatal decision that's made that results in a fatality. And this is what we saw with Andrew Loku. This is what we saw with Abdi Rahman Abdi. This is what we saw with Amelissa Haile. This is what we saw with Jermaine Carvey. So 
you know, there's a way that um, a fear of madness can drive people to try to remove it, but in, in ways that often have really disastrous consequences. So obviously as a mad person, you're very careful about when and how you sort of describe yourself as mad. And I think that, you know, it does, there's a lot of stigma that makes it that people are wary or nervous or afraid of being around you because the perception is what you saw in the Twilight Zone or what you saw in whatever movie, you know, that there's Mm -hmm. just going to be a random series of unexpected events that will be uncontrollable and that will be potentially dangerous for you. And so you must remove yourself from madness, almost as if it was catching, you know, Mm -hmm. almost as if it was a virus. Um, In fact, there was an episode of the Twilight Zone that I saw when I was a child in the 80s, where uh, I guess it was a remake of the Twilight Zone, where the the townspeople discover the meaning of life and that, that when it gets whispered to you in your ear, you go crazy and putting air quotations up for people who are <laughs> listening that you sort mm-hmm. of go crazy because it was just too much information to process. Then there's one last family that hasn't received the information and they're aware that everyone else is acting unexpectedly and unusually um, that usually involves just sort of laughing and making no sense. Um, and so one of the family members goes to try to find help. And when she gets back uh, or when he gets back, then the whole family's infected uh, with crazy because they've been given the meaning of life. And I watched that episode as a child and I was like, oh, this is a message. This message is that it is mad is is catching Uh and it's dangerous. And Uh we, once you go mad, that's it, you know? Um, And I was fed that information just like everybody else. And so for me, you know, experiencing depression and psychosis is, it's a drag. It's not a fun thing to experience, but it's also not the worst part of my life. And it's certainly, there have been beautiful things that have come from it, which is why I so loved that friend saying, well, did you have any fun while you were off on your psychosis? It was just mm-hmm. the reality that I get a lot of art done. I, I can be sometimes more productive. I can be sometimes more intuitive or more connected to sort of spirituality. I have different dreams, um, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, you know, it's not all great, but it's not all bad either. Um, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting thing for me as somebody who, you know, reads for people publicly, you know, the sort of where, where (laughs) it's a question without a, without a universal answer, right? I think it's a question with a specific answer for, for each individual perhaps, but, um, but, you know, from a, from a sort of universal point of view, there's no real answer, but what, what is that intersection between, you know, where, where is the line between spirituality and madness, right? Where is the line between intuition and spirit and, and that stuff coming through and, you know, and other sort of maybe more uh, biological or brain chemistry derived totally. kind of pieces, right? And I found like my, you know, when I was a teenager and, my family had come from a long line of, of, of I guess I, I guess she would say, um, spiritual practitioners. My grandmother was a witch, and my mom um, kind of grew up as a witch, and we were taught a lot of that sort of earth medicine, and you know the kinds of things that were very normalized in our family to talk about, like dreams, like seeing apparitions, like. Um, feeling a sense of connection with people who had passed on already um, was normalized within my house. But then when I, you know, was in my late teens and I was suddenly in the psychiatric industry and you talk about that within that environment, there's no possibility to have a conversation about what is just a genuine spiritual connection and what is, I need to give you more, that's, you know, more clonazepam obviously your Mm -hmm. psychotic, you know, your spiritone. So I learned very quickly in that environment that there was um, uh, a misunderstanding of what spiritual practice could look like and that that combined with stigma around madness made it that I couldn't practice and that I, you know, so that's one thing I would say. And then the other thing I would say is that for me, there's, um, there's a comfort in, spirituality and there's a comfort in 
for me, my, my family's traditions and my tradition has been an ability to be connected with people who had already passed on. And that is something that has come very natural to, and having visionary dreams. And that's come, something that's come very natural to me. Um, but it's very different than the experience of psychosis where you like when I'm in the middle of a psychosis, I could have something telling me something. I could have the sink talking to me, but I'm aware enough that I'm like, the sink is talking to me. I am not feeling well, as opposed to the other experience, which is more about connecting with a spirit or connecting, like which feels very present. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the, the sort of my, my experience, which everyone's experience of psychosis is different. My experience of psychosis is that... Um, it's very uh, unusual things are happening. Um, things that don't normally talk to you, talk to you. And that uh, is a red flag that this is a psychosis, you know, mm-hmm. as yeah. opposed to, oh, I think my relative is trying to communicate to me. Well, I don't think they're communicating to me through the toaster. I just think the toaster's <laughs> talking to me because I'm psycho, you know? Yeah, and yeah. Those are very different. Well, I think that it's... It's very complicated, right? To it's very complicated from the inside, and it's very complicated from the outside, you know. And I'm always, um, you know, over the years, I've run into a variety of people who, uh, you know, where where I've sent them towards, you know, psychiatric intervention, you know, from readings and stuff. And then there are other people who, you know, I send to like spiritual solutions, you know, and it's amazing how how many people fail to distinguish between those things, yeah, and they fail to understand you know what what makes what what might make one different than the other you know I'm thinking of like a few examples uh one uh somebody came to see me because their friend who I had worked with a lot. Uh, felt that they were having a psycho- psychosis as opposed to uh, like an enlightened awakening experience, right? Yes. And, you know, and so in that sense, the, the person had some inroads from another person who had some trust with me and we, you know, worked on that stuff. You know, I was thinking about another person who uh, who was telling me that they had been gone for a month while this other entity walked through them and lived in their body and so on, right? And you know, what, what are these experiences? What are, what's coming from them? You know, are they, are they, you know, mental health? Are they magical? Are they other things, you know? And, you know, I I mean, for me, sort of, especially in the latter case, I'm like, what on earth is the value of giving your body up to something else for a month? What comes from that? That's any helpful. Right. And, you know, Like to me that, you know, and they, they had no real answer, right? Their answer was, well, they wanted it. So I said, sure. And I'm like, "Uh uh-huh. Yeah. And like, so what? Like, you know, just because spirit wants something doesn't mean it gets it right. (laughs) You know? So, so I'm, I'm always very curious about these, um, distinctions and how, how did you become aware of them? You know, were you always aware of them? Yeah, I think. Uh, definitely as a, as a younger person, I was less, I was, I, I really wouldn't have known that there was such a thing as madness. I wouldn't have even questioned, uh, although I, I think I had a fundamental fear of it in the same way that we all are kind of raised to be afraid of it, but I was embraced in the spiritual practice in my family. So, um, yeah, it's it's interesting. For me now, it seems very distinct. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that's just because the nature of my psychosis has been very particular. But like, you know, um, uh, yeah, I guess, it's, I guess it could go a couple of ways, you know, depending on how you're experiencing your distortion from reality. It could really seem like this is the best decision to have a spirit walk in your body for a month, you know? Mm. Um, and in the moment of it, it could, you know, there are ways that your brain tells you that this is a really the best idea, even if it isn't. Um, mm. And that is the nature of madness is that sometimes it makes you do things that you would otherwise not make that decision. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. And I wish that there was more space uh, in, in the systems that work with this, the, you know, medical systems and so on. Totally. You know, I was um, a number of years ago, somebody from one of the facilities here who ran the gambling program got in touch with me and wanted to talk to me about luck, magic, cleansings, and, and people who were in their program and their gambling addiction program and their relationship to these things. And, mm. uh, and in the end, uh, that person's supervisor shut down anything formal happening, which was in terms of having conversations about it, which I think is a real shame because in the same way that um, being, being mad might inform a reason behind a decision, understanding spirituality might also can also inform pathways out of problematic places whether those are purely spiritual or not right and that that is also sort of a a fine dangerous line to play with in some ways because if you get it wrong it can be quite problematic but yeah but if you get it right yeah boom yeah problem solved right yeah Mm -hmm. totally so does this stuff circle back around and relate to your art then as well? Like are there ways in which this well, is? Yeah. I mean, certainly like my art practice has been rooted in a sense of spirituality and that's, you know, the kind of reason why I talk about the portraits is I talk about them with reverence and using very spiritual kind of language for the way that I've done the work that I've done. Um, but I've also, built in and sort of hidden in a lot of, certainly when I was doing painting, a lot of nods and references to psychiatric disabilities. So I did a self-portrait that was for a show at A Space in 2006 and underneath in the underpainting, I wrote out all these sections of the DSM-5, so just the DSM-4, which at the time was a diagnostic and statistical manual for diagnosing psychiatric disabilities. And so I like wrote a whole bunch of those things in and then painted over them and obscured them at the same time as I had um, other, I guess you would call them kind of magical emblems. Like I had a person holding a a branch of cotton that had blood on it, you know, which sort of cotton is a plant that is a very significant plant within my family's history, you know? So um, mixing those two things together, obvious and not obvious, overt and covert, um, has been a big part of my practice for sure. And then I think with the portraits that I've drawn most recently, which are graphite, it's a bit harder to hide in messages into them. But certainly the majority of the people who I have interviewed have in some way experienced um, challenges sometimes with you know, reality or with uh, emotional health. And I think that some of them have been more or less upfront about that, but that that is also part of my practice is choosing to, to do pictures of people who are most marginalized. And often those people mm-hmm. are people who experience psychiatric disability. It's, it's interesting to me too, the sort of dance between covert and overt, you know, I mean, uh, <laughs> we can go on Instagram and look at all these sort of overt witchy, you know, yeah. spiritual, uh, you know, hoodoo, like whatever practitioners, right? Like, you know, my feed is full of people who have, who are, who are working some kind of magic and, you know, you can go and look at it. Right. Um, but so many of these things, so many of these traditions, um, you know, especially the sort of like some of the root work and, you know, and definitely witchcraft at various points in history had to be covert, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like it's, well, you know, take this thing and tuck it underneath the sole of your, like in your shoe, right? Or, you know, like use this bit of something that is, you know, isn't necessarily magical in and of itself, but it is, available you know Mm -hmm. because everybody had access to this kind of fabric or to this kind of thing you know here here are the plants and roots that you're going to find growing around the edges of the farm where you're working and living you know dig up one of these and work with it you know and that that dance between sort of 
covertness and overtness and the way in which um, people's identity around these things is, is sort of playing out is, is very fascinating to me. Mm-hmm. Totally. Totally. And there is like a a covertness and an overtness, I think, within madness as well. Like that's a, a relation. It's how out you are in certain circles and how much you share and how much you don't share. And there are certain people who identify as mad artists and that's like front and center, you know, mm-hmm. and there's there's a power in that in, in, in taking up that space and standing in the front of stigma. I think in the same way that, you know, for some people being unabashed about their spiritual practice it seems very freeing, especially if you were raised in a family where you had to hide away parts of yourself. Um, mm-hmm. And I think about the artwork of artists like Gloria Swain, who did a work, um, an exhibition at Tangled Art Plus Disability last fall that was called The Mad Room. And it was specifically looking at Black women's experience of madness. And, you know, she identified front and center as a mad artist, and it was central to what she was doing. And I think... Um, that doesn't happen that often. It just really doesn't, you know, because mm-hmm. often we are forced into more covert situations in order to keep jobs, in order to keep opportunities flowing because people are so so wary and so fearful. And I think, you know, within sort of the proliferation of very public witchcraft or very public um, spiritual practices, like in, the, in that vein, um, there are some people who are going to have more or less stigma from showing that on Instagram, for example. Mm-hmm. Sure. You know, and, and uh, certainly when you look at um, the way that anti-Black racism and white supremacy has sort of, um, certainly in the last hundred years, made it very difficult for a lot of Black and African diaspora people to practice their spiritual practices in main cities, for example, mm-hmm. you know, versus, you know, maybe the young white 20-something who can put everything a beautiful picture of everything that they've done on instagram and maybe you will fear face different repercussions um i think it's it's complex for sure yeah yeah it's interesting i'm I'm always curious about um for me personally i'm i'm always um playing with identity and you know Mm -hmm. i've talked about this on the podcast at different points and for me much of my magic these days is identity based magic that is i'm i'm working to actually adjust my own consciousness in some way right or my own mm-hmm. sense of self to make other things happen um you know and I, I think that one of one of those in one of those identities that you know i'm have talking to you today i think that i need to go and sit and look at and see what i what i want to adjust with that is this sort of what is the what is my public side of those things you know and yeah because because of the traditions that i sort of came up practicing um being silent and secretive about it has always been kind of a reflex Mm -hmm. and so i think that uh you know going back and re-looking at that and seeing what what comes from that what is the value of that if any at this point or is that um part of the same, you know, I mean, really like sort of waspy colonial, sh- keep all those things away. Right. right. Don't be out right. about your sexuality. Right. Don't be out about your magic. Don't right. be out about your every madness or, you know, anything else. Right. Right? Mm-hmm. No, totally. And like, it actually can be so freeing to be in the ways that we can be safely out and even to create environments where we get to be safely out about all of it and bring mm-hmm. all of ourselves into it. It's, it's so, so freeing. So, I mean, I mean, I, I live like a full-time artist life and because of that, I don't have to work in an office. And because of that, not to say that I don't have to make decisions, absolutely, um, about what I talk about, where I talk about it, but for the most part, I can kind of curate my life to be um, to be my full self most of the time, mm-hmm. which feels very lucky. Indeed. Well, maybe this is a good point to say thank you for sharing your full self here today. It's been wonderful having this conversation. Yeah, thank you so much. And I would just say, like, I really appreciate and high-hive for making space um, 
the spaces that you make to allow us to come together and sort of as a meeting place. Like I think of the Hermit's Lamp so much as a meeting place where you run into the most unlikely people and you get to try out and learn new things. And I'm, I'm very thankful for that space. It's my pleasure. All right. Take care. Thank you, as always, for listening. Uh, I hope you've really enjoyed it. Uh, a big thanks to the lovely human beings who have put some wonderful reviews on iTunes for the podcast. Please do consider supporting the Patreon. You know, I sound like a PBS ad, but seriously, even a dollar helps. It all adds up towards being able to make all sorts of exciting things happen, both for yourself and for others. So head on over to patreon.com slash the hermit's lamp or use the link in the show notes. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.